Well, hello everybody. It is Friday, time for another illustration masterclass. Sorry I was out last week, but I was having something really fun happen to me. Gum surgery. Mm, what a party. Uh, I'd love to do it every week, actually. It's so much fun. Not. So anyway, here we are. We are back for part two of my winter monster drawing. We were talking about character design last time around. Glad you're all here and you can join me. I'm gonna say hi to some folks who are joining me over on behance.net slash Adobe Live. That is where the chat is happening that I'm following. If you're watching over on Twitter or YouTube, go ahead and watch, enjoy the show, no worries. If you wanna ask me some questions during the show, do please head over to Behance and you can do it there. That's behance.net or be.net slash Adobe Live. There you go. What's up, Bliss? Hey, Afroha. Nice to see you, Umicorn and Irene. Frye. Yes, indeed. Frye. Not Friday, Frye. And uh, Creo or Cryo is here. Please tell me how to pronounce your name. I'm sorry. You've joined the show before and I don't know how to say your name. Uh, nice to see you, Wade. Hello. And I see Chris and Christelle and RB. Anyway, nice to see you folks. Thanks for joining me. Why don't we dive right in? I'm going to share my screen with you now here in Photoshop. You may remember that uh, last time we left off, we had this fella right here. He looks really happy. Uh, this is our winter monster. And the way we did this was we decided, okay, why don't we have some materials to work with? And we were talking about what are some of the elements that'll make up this character? We, had, we were talking about snow. We were talking about twigs and winter sticks, you know, sticks with no leaves and things like that. A little bit of ice and whatnot. Uh, that was the first thing that we worked out were the ingredients, so to speak, that would put together this character. Then we explored uh, drawing this character as a one option, but we also had another option. And I'll just hide these for a moment and um, we'll bring up this. This was this other monster that we did, which is a sort of um, monster in the snow, coming up out of the snow, emerging out of the snow. And then we did a little head study of what that monster might look like. And you can see it's kind of skeletal in nature, like a skull. And then we had a carrot nose, um, and that was another way to go. And then more of these sticks kind of growing out of the back of the head. So two fun options, both uh, winter monsters for you. Uh, so today I would like to take um, this uh, one on the top right here with the little hat and try and do a little painting of him. Alrighty. So let's see if I can make that happen. Uh, so we had this sketch at the end of uh, the last episode where I, I just kind of really roughed in a pose. You know, he's kind of standing there kind of yelling. Um, uh, got his, his fist balled up there. And I didn't know if this was really interesting enough as a pose. So I thought maybe what I do is quickly sketch something a bit more sort of powerful and maybe not do the whole body, maybe just do part of it and see how that feels. So I thought we'd start with that. Now the pencil I'm using to sketch with here is from the winter 2022 brush update, which was just uh, released a few weeks ago in the United States and is now worldwide available to everybody with your Creative Cloud subscription. Um, and I'm gonna pull that over here so you can see that. Winter 2022 brushes. Remember, if you wanna grab the brushes, you come up to the little drop down menu here in Photoshop and you say, get more brushes. And that will take you to your login page where you can use your Adobe credentials to sign in and download over 1,900 brushes created by yours truly. Who is yours truly anyway? First name yours, last name truly. Yeah. All right, drinking my coffee substitute, Faco Coffee. And we're gonna get going here. So hide these away. By the way, those of you who don't use libraries, they're pretty handy dandy. I've got a library right here of gouache brushes from the gouache brush set. And this is just a selection of them, a small group that I wanted to try painting with today. And so I decided to make a library of them so I wouldn't have to open my brushes panel and scroll down through all those, you know, thousands of brushes I have, but just have this select little group here for me to mess around with uh, in this little painting exercise. Alrighty, so let's get to it. On something a little bit more dramatic. Before I get going, any questions? Hey, Wade, thank you so much for posting the um, link to the brushes as well. Yes, you can also access all the brushes via the old interweb, and that's a nice way to do it as well. Works just fine. Bonjour, Vanessa. Merci d'être ici avec nous. 
pour un peu d'art euh, pour tout le monde. Oui, on va bien s'amuser. Ok, hope my French was passable there. I'm sure I made some grammatical errors, but you'll forgive me. Now, off to the races. So I think, you know, that that pose was fine. I like this you know, idea of his mouth being open. That's kind of fun and everything. But maybe a bit more dramatic. So um, I wanted to sort of zoom in a little on the, on the torso and on the head and do something where we're kind of getting more of a... the head turned upwards a little bit. So I think like the hat would be actually, and we're looking at it from under the underside here. We'd kind of be seeing it like this. And then have that blocky head kind of coming out this way. Okay. And then have that back like this and then have that mouth open. Now, if you look at the design of the mouth, right? Right over here, it's sort of this upside down U sort of shape. And I want it to just sort of fall open like this. We don't really show too much of like how that head is, it has a structure to it or what's the underlying structure, I should say, of that head since it's kind of more snow than anything else. So I want to keep it kind of soft and sort of flexible, if you know what I mean. Um, but we still have a bit of this, this right here kind of gives this idea of like a, a cheekbone or something, you know, zygomatic bone, um, I believe that is. And, and just this gaping maw like this. And there's that mouth open. Um, I'm looking at the model that we have here and I'm going to try and make sure I stay on the model so that that nose is just kind of like a simple shape like that. Um, we'll keep that like this. All right. And the underside of the nose it doesn't have any nostrils or anything. It's just like a block of snow kind of sitting there. So I'll make that feel a bit more kind of mm, soft, I think, in the painting. We'll, we'll figure that out. Although I might want to make it a bit more chiseled. Now that I look at the design, it is a bit more angular, so that might feel a bit more icy when we get to it, you know? But this area here, you know, I want this transition for the mouth to go from the uh, top of the mouth here and then into the, I want it to curve away into uh, the open part of the mouth, but not have it be a really like sharp transition. And so that'll have to be a soft, uh, a softer transition. And so to make that work, what I'm going to do is, for now, I'm just going to draw these lines that tell me like I'm curving down into that mouth. You know, it's telling me when I get to it, make sure that, that I go from light to dark gradually and I don't make that too sharp, right? So that'll be a, a painting challenge for me when I get to it. You know what I mean? Um, I'm gonna actually take my smudge tool here for a second. And I'm going to grab a smudge tool that I think will work well with dry media. And uh, let's see here. Where is my, my drawing box? Hold on a second. We get in the mega pack or the drawing box and we have a couple of smudge tools here at the top. Grit smudge, rough smudge, rough uh, smudge scatter. The rough smudge is probably a decent one for this. Um, and with that, I'm just going to take this whole area here and just kind of soften it. See? Like that. And already that's kind of achieving a bit of what I want. Um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I'm going to be doing a brush hour next week where I, I'll do a drawing, a graphite drawing. Like, just the whole point of it will be to emulate pencils in Photoshop. That's all I really want to do in that class. Um, 
So go ahead and, and tune into that if that's the kind of thing that floats your boat or if you just want to know more about it. Um, if this past uh, brush, last week's uh, brush hour, what we did was we looked at emulating graphite um, in Photoshop, but we didn't actually do like a, a real drawing, if you like. We just kind of um, showed off some of the brushes that are available to everybody for that purpose, okay? So here again, too, there's going to be a bit of a softer transition there, I think. But for now, what I'm doing, I'm just trying to like understand these shapes a bit better for myself. I like these uh, ocular cavities here for the eyes. All right, you see that? Helps me to get the right shape there. Okay. So that's pretty okay. Um, I have a, a key command tied to my smudge tool. I use the S key, and you can set that up for yourself if you like that. If you need to use smudging a lot, which um, if I'm painting and, and drawing like this, I like to have it available, and I don't like to have to come over here and select it. And I, I love having hotkeys for stuff wherever I can, you know? Um, and so, to do that, if you're on a, a Mac, um, you would come to Edit, and then you would scroll down to Keyboard Shortcuts. And here, it's gonna open up uh, these different uh, categories of shortcuts, and for Tools, for example, is where you wanna be, you would come on down to the Smudge tool, and you would go ahead and assign the letter S to it. Um, and that's how you do it. You can also change any of the, the keyboard shortcuts in Photoshop if you want and um, you know customize them for whatever you like just remember that you know a lot of the keys obviously will already have a keyboard um, uh, an action attached to them right and so for those uh, you might want to be careful about changing them because there's a reason maybe they've been assigned and it might be the kind of action that you don't want to mess with. All right, so just keep that in mind. All right, so we have the these sort of overalls here wrapping around this character like this. And like this. And I'm gonna slide this up and open up one of the hands here. Now we haven't, I hadn't thought about like the hand design for this character. I guess, you know, with monsters, it's always fun to have the fingers be kind of long and kind of sharp or whatever. So that might be the way to go here. I don't know. What do you think? You know, like the, the arms are more... Oh, you know, the fingers could be carrots. That could be kind of cool. That's that's where we could introduce the carrot idea, right? That might work nicely. So I want to have like one coming up this way. There's one carrot. And another carrot, and we'll I'll just make that clear in the painting with the orange color, you know. And we'll have this finger or carrot finger, I should say, kind of just drop in back here. And then this sort of pinky finger, if you like, coming out towards us this way, bending, and then 
disappearing that way. So that is how we're going to do that. Okay. Make sure these make sense where the knuckles are and all that business. Doesn't have to be like totally, you know, perfect in terms of, you know, oh, that looks like a human. We don't want that. We want these to be more carrot-like, but I'm sort of using what I know about anatomy. Like I can put little bumps there like that. Maybe there'll be like a little carroty bump. You know, you ever get like a sort of a mutant carrot in that pack of carrots from the grocery store? The one carrot that just doesn't look like everybody else. Just a little weird. It'll get, got little extra bits popping out here and there, like a mini carrot growing out of it, that kind of thing. And then here's the other, like, thumb carrot down here. So that's fun. And from here, like, looking at my design there, you can see that these forearms... And most of the arms are like a lot more sort of icy looking than the rest of the body, right? So it's like from here you start to get these icy bits. So that's something I want to figure out. All right, pause for just a moment. I'm sure there might be some questions or I like to always check in and see if anybody has anything they wanna ask at this stage. So. Take a look and see what's up. Um, had not, oh, sorry. I just finished with all Oh, sorry. I thought it was a brush question, but it says it's something more about um, topiaries. <laughs> so is this the old the old man kind of yelling at people to get off his lawn? Is is what I'm getting from people in the in the chat. That's funny. All right, now out here in the back, remember we're gonna have some. Uh, stick stuff, right? Some stick designs here. So I'm gonna make those shapes work. And make sure that they have interesting shape design, you know, which is hard sometimes. It's hard not to repeat yourself and make all that stuff look too repetitive, you know, too similar, too samey. So that's always something I got to keep an eye on. And as you come down towards the um, the upper arm here. It just starts to kind of, it's all icy, but less spiky. So those bumps and, and icicles kind of go away and they're replaced with just bits of, you know, sharp ice shapes. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do here. Okay. And then all the rest of this is just snow. 
underneath him. So it could be just like a kind of a bumpy, soft, That's what I love about this pencil is I can use the side of it to just shade and hit these spots nice and light, you know? And right here, I'm gonna have those eyes those tiny little eyes maybe those will be like a bright red or something kind of glowy i don't know that could be kind of neat so there you go that's pretty much where we want to go with this and see how far we get i'm going to try and paint some of this with those brushes um It's, it's easy to get stuck in the in the drawing stage, you know, and start going nuts, but, um, and that's fine. But we only have a little time together, so I thought it'd be nice to try and do some painting as well. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and, and hit um, all this with the smudge tool. What that does is, it's not just smudging it, you know, it's smudgy, which is great. Um, it's also gonna kind of just knock it all back a hair. It's like, you know, taking a rubber eraser and you're drawing with graphite or with charcoal or whatever and just lightly kind of hitting it all over rubbing it into the page a little bit and giving yourself you know what I like to call it I, I teach a portraiture class here in town where I'm actually using charcoal on newsprint and I always tell the students you know this is a nice thing to do to make yourself a ghost on the page give yourself a little ghost and so that way you're not working from nothing. You've got something on the page to react to and to draw on top of, but you can still make changes and you can still um, edit things and all that. It'll be light enough that it won't really get in the way. And um, it's also a nice way to sort of, if you have to correct something, it's okay to have some evidence of where the mistake was to begin with on the page, you know? <clears throat> All right, so there you go. Uh, this smudge tool again, just so people know which one it is, is in the Mega Pack drawing box, and it's called Rough Smudge One Mega Pack drawing box. And it's just really look at this; it's so useful for this kind of thing. I'll zoom in all the way so you can see how convincing that is. It's a good smudgy graphite kind of thing, you know. So let's knock this back a little bit, huh? Let's put that at 50%. So we can see what we're doing there, right? Um, and I'm gonna set that layer to multiply. And then underneath that, I'm gonna add some color. And we'll start with these gouache brushes. So let's grab, um, let's see, this gouache G edge we've got. We've got the gouache G edge soft. Um, I think this wash brush is a good place to start. This gouache G wash tilt fine. Uh, and just to keep things simple, I'm just going to work with white for now. Just knock that in. Just start throwing some white in there. You can probably hear my Wacom. It's actually pronounced Wacom, by the way. Uh, pen on the surface of the tablet there, making that sound. And the reason you're hearing that is I use um, the felt nibs from Wacom. I just love them. They're so nice. Uh, but after, you know, a few months of using one, they do get kind of noisy. They scratch on the surface. But when I say they scratch, I don't mean they do any damage or anything like that. It doesn't do any damage to the surface. It just makes a sound. And my mic is gonna pick that up and I just, I'm sorry about that. Look, I'm not being like super precise with any of this. I'm just throwing this down to get started, right? It's just so I have something to look at. Like so. 
Okay, and then for the hat, you know, I'm just gonna kind of warm that up a little bit, come down this way, like this. A little darker. We'll get that in there. It's almost like kind of watercolor. You can see there's some transparency there. That's coming down to how hard I press with the stylus as well as the tilt that I use. Let's see, any questions here? <laughs> you can hear it, but in Tasmania. <laughs> Are there felt tips for the Apple Pencil? No, but there are rubber tips you can buy. Um, Struffy just mentioned those, yeah. I haven't tried those, um, but I have uh, I have played with uh, screen protectors, different ones, and uh, you know, uh, they're not maybe they're not for me. But I didn't, I didn't find them to be all that great. But I've heard that you need to sort of break them in. You know, you kind of got to give them some time to get less like crazy because the, the, one, the one I was using was just, it was so, um, the texture was so crazy that I felt like I was like scratching the heck out of my my apple pencil nib every time i i drew with it so i guess the key is to sort of wear them down i think i read somewhere that some people what they do is they actually take sandpaper and they smooth it down that way they smooth down these these um screen protectors which i find interesting um so, you know, you could try that, I guess. It'd be an interesting, interesting way to do it. Okay, so I'm just going to get sort of these flat colors in. I say flat, but you know, in reality, um, there's a little bit of texture in this brush that when I want to sort of bring it out, I just tilt the brush a little bit away from being perpendicular to the drawing surface and it'll bring that out a little bit. And, uh, that's a nice thing. So that's not going to be like perfectly straight. I mean flat. I use that softer brush, I can come over this and make a softer transition. Into that dark area there. Like that. And right here underneath where the hat is, you know, I would create like a little bit of a shadow there.
I'm going to start with these pretty solid areas of color just, just to help me with my darks and my lights, you know? And I can always then grab that smudge tool and then use a different smudge for this um, in the paint box, for example. Uh, something like maybe the smudge new, you know, that one's helpful for softening stuff, but also like pulling it to show brush strokes. So I can sort of pull it in a direction like that. And that can help to sort of define what's happening. And you know, I have to be careful because cast shadows and form shadows are gonna look different because cast shadows will have predominantly a harder edge, you know. Um, I'm just trying to figure that stuff out as I go. It can be a little tricky, but. Um, if I was trying to do this with more time to play around, I would probably start with kind of like an underpainting where I would just use one color, probably like a brownish color or something like that. And then I would just work with that to um, work out all the values, all the darks and lights and stuff like that. And then paint over that with color. But we're just kind of diving in here. What I'm doing here is I'm decreasing the strength of the smudge right now, so I can still pull it if I want, um, but it's not gonna be as intense. And that'll give me a, a smoother blend, right? Another thing you can do, which is always a good thing, is you can get your darks and your midtones down pretty pretty early, and then you can paint lighter over those. Um, and you get these, like if you know the art artist Simon Beasley, whose name came up in a previous stream I was doing actually, um, where you got like these high contrast breaks between. Uh, light and dark with the muscles when he, when he paints the muscles of these these big uh, crazy gladiators and um, superheroes and whatever and um, it looks like he basically paints he, he lays down some darks and then the lights come later and that's how that works for him
So you can see here how the smudge tool comes in handy for me softening that transition there like that. And we can hide the sketch for a minute and just see how our painting looks. And then you can, well, when you do that, it's helpful because then you can come in and you can like touch up bits and pieces and stuff. But I like to keep the sketch on for a good long while when I'm starting out. Um, but if I wanted to, like, I could at this stage just start painting and trying to, like, mold it into what I want, you know? Up to you. There's no, like, one way to do any of these things, you know? You have to sort of find something that works that you like and then just work that way. But it's not like I'm going to sit here and say to you, well, if you don't do this, then you're in trouble. It's never going to work. You know, no, of course not. That's not how these things go. I think in the course of this little bit of time I've spent just doing this, I've already mentioned at least like three or four different ways to go about this. So yeah, there's no one, one way to make this work. Okay. So we're going to go over here and we're going to take a small, this um, flow brush is nice for this. We're just going to pop in these, these eyes and they're going to look really flat right now, but we're going to change that later. I'm just trying to get them there for placement. Actually, this one needs to be more like right there. There we go. That's about where we want them. So where does the shadow get darkest? It gets darkest where there is no light that can enter, right? That's called an occlusion shadow. Um, and then as I get out into areas where the light could, could be, then I need to treat those areas differently. I need to make them a little lighter
Okay. And we'll come back to this G flow and we're just gonna hit that there. And we can look at our um, sketch again here in a moment, but first I'm just going to hit that shadow and then smudge it around this away. Ideally, I would want that shadow to feel a bit more transparent and just sort of sit on that form. Um, and the way I would have to do that is I'd have to add another layer and probably use some multiply so that like what we have going on here, um, I would carry that through so that's darker here in the shadow. Um, and then I would layer, uh, use a lighter opacity there, um, but just kind of darken this area here. So it feels like the shadow is still following that form of the head and it's not just, you know, sitting there like a flat shape. You know what I mean? And these are all things that I have to consider later probably, but I just want to mention them now. And this is something that I would do with any medium, digital or otherwise, is I'd have to always be sort of just checking my values and be like, okay, I thought that was dark when I started because I was working on a light um, background, right? But then as I go forward, I realize, well, it's not dark enough. Um, and so, you know, then you have to adjust, right? You can't just commit to something and keep on rolling if you see that it needs to be different. Um, but you also can do it different ways. You could say, okay, I'm going to make something lighter rather than making another thing darker. You might be like, well, I'll have to, if this is too light, I can either darken it or I can uh, lighten whatever is adjacent to it that's making it feel too light. You know? and Whichever of those decisions you make is going to depend on a lot of other things. Um, but 
Sometimes it's hard to know which way to go. I'll turn that sketch back on so you can see where we are here. All right, pause for a second. I want to see if we have any questions. How do you make it not look cartoony? How, oh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, how to make... Oh, you have trouble with the light reflections in the eye. Um... Yeah, well, I haven't quite finished that area, but uh, I think the idea is if you just if to just give it dimension, like make it feel like it has form, you know, like it's a it's a three dimensional thing. It's not just sitting there um, on top of the drawing. You know what I mean? It's like I haven't gotten there yet, but I want to really make this feel like it's set in. So I'm using these darker shapes around it, underneath it, right? Carefully. Don't want to go crazy, but and at this level too, I'm really I'm working at the pixel level here. I'm getting really small. Um, you know, this is at 100%. This is how big this is. So that's a small area to be dealing with. Um. So, you know, paint paint bigger. That'll help too. So you give yourself more more choices and more room to, to work, right? Um But check out uh, this wonderful book by James Gurney called Color and Light. And just see all the many ways you can trick people into thinking that things are 3D and um, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's just so cool the things you can do to, to, to convince people that something is, is three-dimensional. It's, it's pretty neat. If you hear the violins again, you know what time it is. My kids are always playing violin when I have my master classes, it seems. It seems to be the way it is. Anybody who's watched any of these knows that that's a pretty frequent thing. Sounds like they're playing Fandango, I think, right now. The latest piece they got to work on. Oh, and you know what? My son got third place in a statewide violin competition. How about that? What do you think about that? And my daughter, who's she's only 13, she was competing against 18-year-olds um, and still crushed it. She was awesome. So Impressive kids. I certainly wasn't doing anything that impressive when I was their age, I'll tell you that. No sorry, Bob. All right, you got me obsessed with the eyes. All right, moving on. So why don't we take a look at this without the sketch here for a moment. And you can see it's slow going, right? But you can see how this comes together and how we just keep going with the, um, the brushes there to get what we want. <laughs> but yeah, you gotta be, you gotta be patient. And you gotta just work through it. You know? That's just the way it is. Now another thing you can do is, if you wanted to, this is a fun thing to do, which I could do too here, is you can do this. You can take your sketch and you can merge it with your um, painting layer. And just make them one layer and then just paint directly on your drawing. Um, I've done this a bunch of times. And what you do is you allow the drawing, some of the lines in the drawing and everything to just still be there. And they help to define, you know, everything that's going on. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. So if you want to do that, you know, by all means, um, 
Nobody's stopping you. It's a good way to go. I'm using that other scatter now, this the one from the drawing pack, just to kind of soften some of what's going on there. And you can see that that helps, right? To give that area some um, some clarity there. That that got a little funny there. What did I do? I don't know what happened there. But something got weird there. Maybe when I merge that layer, or I might have like accidentally hit the um, the canvas with the brush when I was talking or something. Didn't mean to do that. And we'll take that dark blue there and we'll use the flow brush. And we'll just come in here and we'll just hit that right there, right there at the bottom. And that tiny little bit of, of that tiny little dark bit right there where it bumps up against sort of the lower eyelid. And then right here, under the upper eyelid will also help it sit inside this area. Umacorn, I hope that helps you to see what that does. Okay, see that? Kind of sits it down in there a little bit. I can always do this too. I can come around here and make a selection and then I can selectively smudge that area to just kind of soften it, help it blend a bit better. All right, so coming back to this, this color here, we want to go a little lighter. So we're going to go like about like this. And we just want to quickly just knock this in, this shape right here, okay? We just do that, boom. And you see how that defines that, right? And then I can use a lighter color like this and I can tilt my brush. There we go. And paint over it. And that's gonna lighten it, but also give it a bit of texture. And then I can hit those edges with the white again, like this. Tilting these gouache brushes, the gouache G brushes, basically makes them have more texture and like a little bit of a dry brush effect. It also makes it so that there's a, they're a little less opaque, okay? So that's a handy tip for you. Be aware of that. And then again with the white, just kind of hit over it like this. See what that does? Nice effect. Well, gang, that's it. I guess uh, we'll have to pick this up next time. I hope you take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Remember to be kind, have a great weekend, and I'll see you next time. Ciao for now.